<laughs> okay, now now it should be okay, right? Okay, hello everyone. And how much time I have? Fifteen minutes. Okay. Um good afternoon everyone. I I'm gonna give another example of how the precautionary uh, principle is not implemented in Europe. Um presenting uh, the best side regulation. Um, and I forgot to say, I am from Best Side Action Network Europe. If you don't know my organization, uh, we work to replace hazardous pesticides with environmental alternatives. So we're a bingo and not a bingo, no, according to this morning. Um, okay, so. Next slide. Let's go a bit fast. So for precautionary principle, uh, for we heard that earlier that we have the treaty on the functioning of the European Union. And for PESA, we have a very specific, we have a new regulation. Uh, it's actually, it was a directive beforehand, but since 2009, we have a regulation that says specifically that the, the provision of these regulations are underpinned by the precautionary principle in order to ensure that active substances or products place on the market do not adversely affect human or animal health or the environment. So it's quite clear. Then it goes to the Article 13 and says risk managers have to take the precautionary uh, principle into account. And here we go to the general food law, which is a wider piece of legislation. And it clearly says, again, that we see that if there is available information showing harmful, so yeah, on health is identified by scientific assertiveness per se, uh, they can take a provisional risk management measures necessarily to ensure the high level um, of health protection chosen by the community. So here, the risk managers are the European Mission, uh, the European Commission and member states. And so the best side regulation is very clear on how to implement uh, the precautionary principle. Now, this is indeed a very good piece uh, of legislation because it calls to it recognizes that pesticides have harmful effects. So it, it wants to ensure a high level of protection for everyone, that's humans, animals, and the environment ecosystems, to protect the vulnerable, not only the workers, um, but the residents, but also the vulnerable uh, population, uh, pregnant women and children and babies, apply the precautionary principle, consider the harmful effects of active substances of the whole products and the residues that we find in food and the environment, and also to consider mixture effects. Now, to achieve this, it has certain classes that they are identified as hazards. So here we have mutagens, carcinogens, toxic reproduction, endocrine disruptors, and PBTs. This is persisted by accumulated oxygen. So if any substance is identified to fulfill these properties, then it must be banned or used with very, very, in a very restrictive way. So there is a paradox when it comes to pesticide because the pesticide products, like the combination of active ingredients and core formulas, they are designed in such a way to have a biological action, but to have to intoxicate living organisms. So they can penetrate through uh, biological membranes and reach uh, the pro interfere with actions of proteins and enzymes and so forth. So uh, they can have ad adversely affect uh, non-target organisms and that could have an impact on population and they have a high possibility to uh, cause harm to human and animals. And it's true, the, although this, Although we have a very good uh, regulation, it's not implemented in practice. And we see this with uh, numerous articles that they get we've seen uh, being published, how the pesticide levels in the environment are much higher than the ones that we have we predict with risk assessment, how rivers across uh, Europe, they have chemicals above the levels that they produce uh, toxic effects in aquatic organisms, uh, we have uh, contamination from fungicides and resistance. 
We have, um, we know how neonicotinoids uh, affect honeybees, uh, not only but honeybees, we have butterflies. Um, here is this uh, known uh, study where it shows that 75% of insect biomass disappeared in Germany in 27 years. And of course, if we have no insects, we have no birds. Uh, birds population are going down in Europe. Uh, this is a French study uh, showing how um, some, some species of birds, they have disappeared up to 60 or 70 percent. And of course, we come to human effects. Uh, we know that cancer incidence is quite high in farmers in the specific, very certain uh, cancers, like, for example, prostate cancer. But also here we have the cutaneous melanoma, that apparently if it's in combination with, uh, with sun radiation, you can have higher toxicity. Uh, we have more and more studies on effects of pesticides on thyroid, and of course, neural uh, developmental uh, effects, which um, we have seen how exposure of children to certain pesticides, they can affect the brain development. So, all of this is quite of concern, especially if we look at the number of active substances since the regulation is actually increasing in the European market. And, and the reason we are very concerned is because these chemicals are used everywhere. I mean, they use it in the production of crops, but also in the production of clothes. And they can be detected in cotton, so they are detected in various products. You can see they're used very close to residential areas. Of course, they've found that's residues of food. And they're used, of course, in pest management um, in parks. So all the European population is exposed. How much of pesticides uh, we use, we don't know exactly, but we know how much we buy. And we don't know with specific pesticides because these data are not public. But we know with groups. So this is, we know that we're using 380,000 tons of active substance per year. We, we buy them, so we must be using them. And you can see in the last uh, years, there's no much change. And we have the southern countries using mo most, the most, uh, then followed by uh, the middle, and then the least uh, cells are, are in the north. Um, and so 40% of the whole uh, uh, European area is, de uh, is dedicated to agriculture, is used for agriculture, and 92% of us are using pesticides. So this is quite a lot. And we can see the top uh, buyers here, <laughs> like uh, Spain, France, Italy, Germany, Poland, UK. But then if we look at the intensity of how much they use, we can see that the picture changes a little bit. So we see that Netherlands and Belgium are also using pesticides quite intensely. Um, I'm not going to go in detail on this, but this is the authorized active substances in Europe. And this is a toxicity category. This is pesticides that they have been uh, authorized and they are right now in the market. So maybe the worst uh, case is this one, that they, they should be banned, but they're still in the market. We have 10 pesticides, but you also have, can see um, the other class of toxicity. And for endocrine disruption, because we got the criteria just uh, in the beginning, end of last year, we're still waiting to see if any pesticide will be banned because of the endocrine disrupting properties. So uh, here we have a quote uh, on precautionary principle from uh, Health Commissioner Vitenis Androukaitis, the previous one. And it says that acting in accordance with precautionary principle means taking action when you know there is a risk, but you cannot assess precisely the level of risk, which is a little bit what we saw this morning. So, uh, what we see that they're doing is they want to prove that there is no risk. Therefore, we don't need to apply the precautionary principle because there is no risk. And here I'm going to give three examples of how this is happening. Sorry, this is going on. Um, 
I invite you all to have a look at our white paper that we have produced where we have a lot of more uh, examples of problems that we see with the current pesticide regulation. Um, but here I'm just going to focus on three of them. In risk assessment, the assessment of active substance versus whole product and pesticide mixtures. So when it comes to risk assessment, the first thing that we need to all realize is that the <coughs> assessment is based on a set of data requirements which are all um, inst industry sponsored studies. So the industry has to provide its own studies. Uh, these studies are confidential. Uh, that will change in 2021 uh, with a modification of the general food law. Um, we see a poor reporting of adverse effects. So when finally the, uh, the assessment is complete and the first uh, state of the assessment of complete and we get these studies, we see very poor reporting. And we also notice that adverse effects are dismissed with what we call unscientific reasons. So uh, here I'm going to give a very classic example, glyphosate. Um, I hope you all know the discrepancy between IR, the WHO uh, uh, research on cancer, on cancer that they found that is probably carcinogenic, and uh, glyphosate is probably carcinogenic. This should result in a ban in Europe, but it didn't because uh, European institutions found that it's not, there's no carcinogenic risk. So here, very specifically, I've picked up the five uh, studies where they found that there was malignant lymphoma, here renal tumors, or hepatosangrioma. Um, and you can see that the five studies of the industry, these are the industry studies, they report uh, increases in tumors in one way or the other. Uh, however, uh, the first, the, this one that was uh, the, the biggest increase, you can see there was a reported a virus infection which was never verified. And for the last, uh, these four, uh, although these were significant, uh, these increases, they, pick, they decided to compare with the historical controls. This is old uh, controls that they have from uh, previous experiments. They're not exposed, but here they went to the extreme of a pool of 22 years. Usually it's five years maximum that you can use. So suddenly all of these were non-significant spontaneous tumors if you were for, so far. Um, I said predominantly here because you do, in the PESA regulation, you must use scientific peer review literature. It's here in the article 8.5. But what we see is, uh, and this, there is a reason why, because if we see now we focus on the industry studies, and uh, here is the case of genotoxicity, we can see that is a very small spark, a function, a part, I'm sorry fraction that is inconclusive and the rest say that there is no DNA damage and then if we go to the published literature it changes the picture changes completely so um, what they managed to do is to dismiss most of the scientific studies as uh, non-reliable or non-relevant because they're not following the standards of the industry study, but they don't need to because they're not industry studies, they're academic studies. And this is for GOP and uh, OECD protocol, but I'm not going to go into detail because we have a very strict time. And then the other thing is that the studies on products are dismissed because they're outside the framework of assessment of the active substance. So it's safe to use. Now, uh, when we come to products, here's a small clarification. The active substance is um, assessed at the EU level. This is the most famous uh, procedure. Uh, and the formulated products are assessed by the member state, but it's much less, let's call it, uh, thorough assessment. So the most thorough assessment is the one in the active substance. Um, 
So when they find, so they assess this in the way that I saw earlier, and then when they go to the product, they say there's no carcinogenicity because we checked the active substance and there was no carcinogenicity, therefore it's not carcinogenic. Now coming to the court case that was mentioned uh, before, um, it was it was examining if the general rules governing the approval of glyphosate were unlawful. And it didn't say exactly that they were unlawful, but it did say that uh, they were not, so they, they was not assessed um, completely for the toxicity that the regulation foresees. The, the regulation says it should cause no harmful effect and they were not, the testing that were done on the whole product or glyphosate product were not sufficient. Now, another two elements they said is that it cannot be the industry identified which is the active substance. I mean, usually they say, uh, this is the active substance and this is the substance that I'm testing thoroughly. Maybe it's not up to them, they shouldn't be them to identify if there's no other such active substance. And then the last one, this is my next one, I can have one more time. <laughs> It's about mixtures, and this will take me to my next point. We have very clear legal requirements to assess mixture toxicity when it comes to pesticides. And we have it in two different pieces of legislation. The one is a pesticide uh, legislation, and the other one is a maximum residue limit in food, like for residues in food. Um, so, as you can see, taking into account cumulative and synergistic effect, this is both for products and residues. So there, yeah, like effects on mix of pesticide mixtures are not assessed. Uh, the assessment is done substance by substance. Not even the whole products is assessed as thoroughly as the individual substances. And unfortunately, the evidence that we have that mixtures of chemicals, not just pesticides, but a combination of uh, either many pesticides, different pesticides, or uh, just, uh, or with combination with uh, aspartame or other uh, chemicals, they might have uh, adverse effects below these no observed adverse effect levels or below the ones that we see effects when we see individual substances alone. Here is a, uh, is a, uh, just a, an example of the residues in food, you can see that apples may have uh, 17 different pesticides, like one sample of, of apples can have up to 17 uh, different pesticides and so on. And here is a study, it's a bit concerning because EFSA, uh, the European Food Safety Authority did a study on looking cumulative effects, chronic effects on thyroid of pesticides and it concludes that there is no re need to take and uh, there is no need to take regulatory action. And so, just to finalize, uh, not yeah, just with a positive message, uh, we have a new commission now, so it's a new opportunity that we can act. Um, there is a European Green Deal that calls zero pollution ambition and talks about pesticides, hazardous chemicals, endocrine disruptors, and so on. Uh, we have um, the implementation of uh, the precautionary principle was decided by the previous parliament. Uh, we have a review of these uh, regulations that they could leave us some space to act and put some uh, policy uh, pressure. And at the end, something that is very important, they forget when they, uh, when they uh, assess the toxicity of pesticides, is that we have the sustainable use of pesticides directive. They calls to use pesticides as a last resort when you have tried all the other non-chemical alternatives and they have failed. Um, not exactly in these words, but it says to give priority to non-chemical alternatives and protect and restore biodiversity. Thank you very much for the extra time and thank you.